We've got to actually say, what are the set of first principles and first values that actually bind human beings? And those first principles and first values need to articulate right, a universal grammar of value that becomes the ground of a world religion. And then that world religion needs to be a context for our diversity, meaning for a hundred different religions. Right? And each religion can be unique, and each religion has a unique expression, and each religion focuses on a different dimension, and each religion becomes expert at, at something particular. A wildly important week. This is, this is the beginning of a next step. At this moment, between utopia and dystopia, to come together with such a radical joy and such a radical positivity, such a radical knowing that the evolutionary impulse quite literally beats in us, as us, and through us, which is the new knowing of our identity, right? I am a personal face of the evolutionary impulse. And to step into this space in between, this time between worlds, this time between stories, this moment in which, in the Renaissance, the structures of the pre-modern traditional world were breaking down. And the most potent response was to articulate, right, to enact, right, to envision, to tell a new story. But and we're very careful here, and every word matters here, not a new story of conjecture, right, meaning not a new contrived story, right, not a new fairy tale. A fairy tale is a story that's not about reality. That's why it's called a fairy tale. But to actually tell something far more compelling than a fairy tale, to tell a new story of value, a new story of God and, and man and woman, and the relationship between all three, a new story of gnosis, of, of knowing and how we know, a new story of, of human beauty. And beauty always means in, in the great lineage traditions of Kabbalah, the interior sciences, and for example, in, in someone like Alfred North Whitehead, right? Beauty always means the inclusion of everything on the inside. I'm not a, I'm not a big reader of Whitehead, but occasionally I'll be thinking about something or feeling into something or, or, or deep in some version of, of a lineage. And I'll be perusing through Whitehead and I'll notice that someplace He's actually getting a sense of the same idea. So that happened to me recently, a few months ago, as I was giving a talk on beauty. And I happened to be just as I was falling asleep, just not even reading, kind of perusing Whitehead, a bunch of unlinked paragraphs in a book called Process and Reality and Adventures and Ideas. And I was just, you know, as I was falling asleep and I realized, oh, just by a line here and there, oh, he gets this. Beauty means nothing split off. Beauty means that it's whole, right? That, that there's no part of us that we're not intimate with, and there's no part of reality that we're not intimate with. So beauty is a form of intimacy, in which there's the widest sense of shared identity that's possible. And if you just got those two lines, you came to one mountain, you got those two lines, oh my God, that's huge. Beauty means the deepest intimacy. Intimacy means the widest sense of shared identity. I'm identified across with all, nothing split off. There's nothing split off in me. There's nothing split off between us. There's no words that can't be spoken. All words are spoken in the right way, in the right tone at the right time and are integrated into a larger whole. That's what beauty is. So we want to generate the most, right? That's what the Renaissance was about. They wanted to generate the, a new possible vision of human beauty and a, a new vision of human truth and a new vision of human goodness. And to the extent that they were able to paint that, that da Vinci was able to paint it, right? That Marcello Ficino was able to write it, right? That that these thousand thinkers involved at, at the core of the Renaissance were able to, excuse me, to formulate this vision of beauty accurately, beautifully, with nothing left out. The vision of beauty actually generated the great dignities of modernity that Habermas speaks so beautifully about. But to the extent that things were left out, to the extent that things were overlooked, to, things, to the extent that there were dimensions of reality that were split off from the larger beauty and larger vision, it turned ugly. And that's actually what happened. What happened is we, we exploded with new interior technologies, right? At the beginning of the Renaissance, this new story of God, this new vision of the human being, right? This new vision of, 
of, of, of the feminine, this new vision of universal human rights, this new vision of third person scientific method, all these, these beautiful new interior technologies. And they actually articulated and unfolded the story of modernity. It was huge. But then, stay close, friends. Then we stopped. Then interior technologies froze there and exterior technologies kept developing. That's what happened. We froze at this moment in modernity in which we had this, this loose, ill-defined sense of what the human being was. We said, okay, the human being is no longer a vassal or a, a serf or a, a slave. The human being has dignity, right, as a separate self. That was a huge revolution. All human beings have dignity. That was part of the third person view, right? All human beings are part of the same larger, great set. But we didn't actually work out the deeper structures of value. Why does the human being have dignity? Where does that dignity derive from? Right? Is value real or is it not real? Now, stay close, friends. What modernity did is it borrowed, modernity borrowed from the spiritual and social capital of pre-modernity to kind of assume value, right? To assume that goodness, truth, and beauty were real, but, but actually to blur the conversation, right? To actually not really look at what the root was. Right, to talk about the importance of the first, first, first person voice, the, the person of the human being, but not to root the idea of personhood in an essential field of value. Does that make sense? So in other words, what happened was modernity borrowed from the kind of assumptions of the kind of spiritual and social capital of pre-modernity, but didn't actually do its own work. So the interior technology stopped. We kind of assumed, what did we assume? We assumed that life, liberty, and happiness, and the pursuit of happiness, right? For example, in the American founding documents are self-evident truths. But by saying they were self-evident truths, we were actually ducking around something. Why are they self-evident? How do we know them? Where are they from? What's our new story of value? We skipped all that. We thought that wasn't necessary. We thought we could just assume that. And we lived with, with what I would call, right? And we call this in, in our new vision of cosmorotic humanism when we're talking about modernity, right? Modernity articulated a list of what I call common sense sacred axioms, right? We just, we just, wow, we have free will. Yeah, we choose, right? Goodness matters. Yeah, our choices matter. You know, our, right? And we, we made all these assumptions about virtue and what it means to be a good person. But they were really drawn right from pre-modernity. And we just we kind of universalized them in modernity, but we didn't actually root them in real thinking and real heart and real knowing. Right. And, and actually, what we actually said in our really deep writings, we said, really, guys, wink wink, says David Hume, wink wink. Value is not really real. We're really making it up. Right. But but we don't really have a ground for it, but that's okay. We'll just, we'll just put that in the space and, and, and everyone just kind of assumes that's true. So, so it's okay. Now you think I'm exaggerating. I'm not. In other words, do we, we avoided all the real issues, right? About God, about divinity, right? About human beings, right? About is love real? Is value real? And we said, you know what? We're going to bypass that stuff. And it didn't work. Along came postmodernity. And postmodernity said, actually, if you read the last 200 years of the best thought, value's not actually real. It's actually made up. The good, the true, and the beautiful are not actually real. They're actually made up. And all we really have is everyone's individual perspective and nothing else. And so value collapsed. So we found ourselves in a world in with which there was no longer a shared story of value. The assumed story which bypassed the real conversations, the real hard work that dominated modernity fell apart. Post-modernity post pointed out all the flaws of that story. And at the very center of society, there was a collapse of value. Ukraine should not be happening. The reason the Ukraine's happening is because, is because since modernity didn't establish a shared ground of value, so what you have is 
you have all these attempts to create visions of pseudo value, right? So ethnocentric pride, right, in Mother Russia and the intrinsic rights of Mother Russia, right? That's a grab at value, right? That's a claim for a certain kind of ethnocentric value. We got to have some value. So our value is going to be Mother Russia. And there's no objective standard of value by which we can actually hold Putin responsible in any way, because there's no universal ground of value that exists between the nations. Does everyone get that? So what we're going to look at in these weeks, we're going to start a new series today. We're going to look at what would it actually mean, right, to create a new vision of value in the world, which actually could articulate for the first time in world history, right, a vision, not just of a kind of pseudo, you know, amorphic, placid, you know, wimpy, you know, lacking potency, right, kind of new age sweetness, that's not going to get us home. What would it actually mean to articulate a vision of a new world religion? That's the question we're asking. And, and I want to stay with this with you for a second, okay? Can we stay with this for a second? Everyone ready? Okay, everyone ready? Who's ready? Let's let's find it. Let's find each other in the chat box. And I want to see if we can kind of we can kind of find this conversation, right? We're on we're on we're on day what of the war? Did someone just write day 63? Someone just write day 63? Write it again if you wrote it. Write day 63. Thank you. Right? Oh my God. Right? So what do we have to do? We're in this moment in which there's a collapse of value at the very center of society. Whenever we have a collapse of value, right? You ready, everybody? You've got a collapse of eros because eros and value are intrinsically related. You can't have eros. And what's eros? Eros is the aliveness of cosmos that's filled with value. When you don't live in eros, we don't live in the fullness of eros. When you're not part of the movement of eros, when you don't feel the eros of cosmos alive in you, then it breaks down. You're lost in the emptiness. You're not filled with value. We're not filled with value. When we don't have eros, we don't have value, what replaces it? Anybody? What replaces it? Well, anybody? Who tell me? You tell me. Chat box. What replaces it? What replaces it always is pseudo eros. When we don't have eros, we have pseudo eros. When we don't have value, we have pseudo value. That's step one. Everybody got step one? Who's got step one? That's step one. Okay. Now let's go to the next step. Now, what is pseudo value? What is pseudo eros? Pseudo value and pseudo eros is an attempt to cover up the emptiness when there's not real value, there's not real eros. Okay. So what would be kind of an expression of pseudo eros, pseudo value? Right, real eros, real value means there's a real story of value. It means cosmos has a real story of value, and I'm part of that story. I participate in the story of value of cosmos. Cosmos actually has direction, it has purpose, intrinsic meaning. If we don't have that, if we don't, we don't have eros, intrinsic meaning, real value, what are we going to get? We're going to get pseudo eros, we're going to get pseudo value, we're going to get pseudo meaning. Does everyone get that? So now, what is the primary example of kind of pseudo eros, pseudo value, pseudo meaning, or is said differently, a kind of pseudo story of value that dominates reality at this moment in time all over the world? It drives Putin in different ways. It drives the United States, it drives Europe, it drives Asia. All right, what is it? What it is, is, is another story. And the story is what we're going to call the success story. And the success story is the world is dominated by rivalrous conflict, rivals, rivals, R-I-V-A-L-S, rivalrous conflict. Rivalrous conflict is governed by win-lose metrics. Power means winning in rivalrous conflict. That's governed by win-lose. There's a winner and there's a loser. The winner is successful. The loser's not. That idea of rivalrous conflict, whether it's in economics, 
and the basic structures of our economics, whether it's in politics, right? Whether it's between sports teams, whether it's between divisions and companies, whether it's between people in a family system, right? Right. Without actually getting that actually, you know, rivalrous conflict drives the story. I was talking a couple of years ago, we actually just got in touch with each other again to my friend, Dick Schwartz, who created something called Internal Family Systems that was actually been on our board for, for the last bunch of years. And we were talking about in a family system, right? The hidden structures, actually, the real structures, rivalrous conflict, right? There's rivalrous conflict between the people in the family. And unless you can actually introduce into the family system, Eros, right? Something deeper than rivalrous conflict, a deeper story of value, the family collapses, all systems collapse, right? If they're driven by rivalrous conflict. Now, what we've done in reality, let's catch this for a second. We've actually removed the eros from reality, meaning we've removed the value from reality. We've stepped out of, you can never step out of the field of value, but we experience ourselves as having stepped out of the field of value. And once I've stepped out of the field of value and in the field of value, there's purpose and there's meaning. And then there's direction, but we've stepped out of that field of value. Now we're going to get to it in a second. We've stepped out of it for some really good reasons. Let's get to that. Let's bracket that for a second. But we've stepped out, but we can't. We can't remain in a place that we've stepped out because we can't live that way. The human being can't live without a story. It's one of the ways we know story is real. Story is part of the ontology of reality. I can't live without being part of a story of value. So I'm not in a real story of value. If I can't find a real story of value, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to make up a story of value. I'm going to create a pseudo story of value. And that's what Foucault meant when he said it's all a drive for power. And we're making up stories of value, which are not real, because all we really have left is rivalrous conflict based on win-lose metrics. Okay, how many people got that? How many people got like a little bit of that riff? It was a big riff. Who got it? Who got just a sense of an over, just a general sense of it? Okay. Like, wow. Okay. Like, wow. So I want to put one last thing on the table and we're going to go to our code. And this is just, we're just saying hello today. We're going to do a crazy deep dive today. Okay. We're going to do a crazy deep dive. So all of existential risk, all the 11 forms of existential risk, which is a word that we use so loosely, existential risk, we've been using that word for a decade here, but existential risk means there's, we're, we're rapidly getting to a point where there's going to actually not be a future, all right? Not, it's not about catastrophic risk. But existential risk, though, actually won't be a future, right? We're going to actually self-terminate because the growth curves, right, driven by exponential technology, which are governed by a race to the bottom, by the tragedies of the commons, multipolar traps, meaning, right, there's weaponized, dangerous technologies of multiple forms, but no one can afford not to develop them because you're afraid that the other guy will. So these exponentially proliferating and developing at a breakneck speed technology are being developed literally right now. And particularly in realms of artificial intelligence where they're, they're particularly dangerous. Actually, I, I think the biggest dangers are in those realms, which have the capacity to actually terminate human existence in the planet. And yet the technologies are being developed anyways, because of the multipolar trap, right? Somebody else might develop it. And the reason someone else will develop it is because the only story we have is a pseudo eros story of the success story, rivalrous conflict governed by win lose metrics. And as long as that's my identity, right, I'm going to fulfill my identity. My identity is I've got to be more powerful. I've got to be more successful, right? I've got to accumulate more wealth. I've got to accumulate more status. That's my very identity. There's not another identity that I live in. So as long as that's my identity as an individual or as a collective, I won't be able to ignore, right, the invitation to develop a, a weaponized exponential technology. I will. And since I think that, that you will, then I'm going to have to. Does everyone begin to get the system? The entire system, right, is governed. Does everyone get this? The entire system is governed by this pseudo story of value, which is called rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. That's the entire system. Now, if we don't replace that with a new story of value, right, we're gone. End game. How do you do that? So the truth is that every society always had some version of a story of value that actually 
challenged power. Even when that story of value was corrupt, it still held some check in society. And, and that countervailing force was called spirit and was formalized in something called religion. Now, I'm obviously completely aware that religion was hijacked in a thousand ways. We said that last week, we've said that a thousand times. But religion in its ideal form was meant to be a system of value that guides power. Religion's meant to be an interior technology that guides the deployment of the artifacts of politics, of the artifacts of public power, of the artifacts of external power. Now, clearly religion got hijacked by power. Clearly the state bound religion. Clearly religion got degraded and corrupted in a thousand different ways. But the idea was, and it functioned to some extent in pre-modernity, it was to some extent a balancing force. There was some system of value that was beyond rivalrous conflict governed by Windler's metrics. But religion was in the public space and it did create in some sense a balancing force, although insufficiently so, because religion became ethnocentric. It became hijacked by particular kingdoms, by particular ethnocentric groups. It got hijacked, right, and, and co-opted, right, and bound right, by the power structures. Yes, that's all true. But the idea was, right, which was always half fulfilled, is that religion would be a structure, right, within the state, within the local domain that would actually guide us in the right direction. And then religion collapses. Does everyone get that religion collapses? It collapses for all, all the reasons of, of corruption. It collapses because of its overreaches. It collapses because religion claims to know things that it didn't know. It collapses because religion tries to control the sciences right, and control knowledge and to actually stop the flow of knowledge and stop the flow of creativity because religion actually became drunk with power. That's all true. And so religion actually collapses, pre-modern religion collapses, okay? Then we head into modernity. So let's take a look at it. Step one, religion. It's always three, three levels. Step one, religion. Step two, modernity, no religion. Now, when I say no religion, it doesn't mean religion disappears. It doesn't mean religion doesn't exist. But religion moves from the center of culture to the sidelines. Right? God's no longer the center of culture. The priest is no longer the center of culture. Religious doctrine is no longer the center of culture. Actually, this notion of science, the human being, third-person information, knowledge, all moves to the center. It's a fantastic Right, progression. So step one, religion. Step two, no religion. But in this no religion space, right, exterior technologies start exploding exponentially. And in this absence of a story that's guiding me, right, devotion, worship of God, self-transformation, the cultivation of virtue, the development of the ethical, spiritual self. In absence of all those stories, those stories of value, we create a new story of value, the success story. And that success story drives exterior technologies. So interior technologies freeze at the beginning of modernity. Exterior technologies go wild. In that gap, existential risk is created. Okay? So level two is no religion. Absence of stories of intrinsic value. Level three she comes in threes. It's always threes. It's always a tripartite structure. It's always what we call in, in this new story of value, which we call cosmorotic humanism. Or we call this trialectics. Trialectics means she comes in threes. Religion, no religion, religion. Okay? So level three has got to be religion again. But it can't be, level three can't be level one religion. It can't be dogmatic religion. It can't be religion hijacked for power. It can't be ethnocentric. It can't be, right? It can't be any of the things that the old religion was, but it's got to be something new. It's got to transcend and include whatever the best insights were of pre-modernity, the old religion, the best insights of modernity that rejected religion. Those two sets of insights need to be integrated. We, we negate, as Hegel said, all the bad stuff. We preserve all the good stuff. Hegel's phrase, negate and preserve. And we create something new. That's the new religion. And the new religion can't be local. Does everyone get this? Can't be local, right? And, and Becca, Becca, right? I love what you wrote. It's got to be a religion of compassion and kindness, but that's not enough. That's not enough, right? Because the pre-modern religion said we're religions of compassion and kindness. And modernity said we're all about compassion and kindness. 
right? So we, we need to do more than that, right? We need to actually establish how do we establish value, right? Compassion and kindness are values. How do I establish compassion and kindness as values? And what do those mean, right? Putin, I'm going to get this. Putin comes to Israel, right? And I mentioned this a few weeks ago in One Mountain. And this is a story I know personally. And he, he finds his third grade teacher and he has total compassion that she has no money and he wants to be kind to her and he buys her an apartment. Compassion and kindness, right? But insufficient. We need actually a, a set of first principles and first values that, that establish what is compassion, what is kindness, and, and how do we unfold them, right? We got to move from, from ethnocentric compassion, right, to a, a larger universal vision of compassion. We got to know what that means, though. And let's call it eros. Let's call it love. Right? What does kindness mean? Right? And who's in the circle of kindness? And how does that, right? So we actually need to articulate a new religion, right, which is not a local religion. It's a world religion. And why do we need a world religion? Because we live in a world space that's one space. Local spaces are almost irrelevant in multiple ways. Our supply chains are completely interconnected. Our chains of money currency are completely connected, right? Our, right? Our economic interdependence, our political interdependence, right? All vulnerabilities are interdependent. Pandemics, right, are not local plagues, not a local plague in Egypt. It's international plagues. Everything is global. So just imagine a second, a world in which everything's global except for religion. Whoa, does everyone get that? Everything's global except for religion, meaning the binding force of religion level three, not religion level one, the binding force of religion level three is local. All the problems, all the issues, all of society is interdependent, interdigitated, interincluded, global. That's where we are today. It's where we are today in the world. Does everyone get it? Where we are today in the world is in a place in which we have the old pre-modern religions doing their thing all over the globe, right? So like the Russian Orthodox Church today is holding services because it's Easter Sunday, right? In the Russian Orthodox Church today. But of course, they're denying a truce in the Ukraine. No problem doing that. This is classical pre-modern religion at its worst. No, no truce for the Ukrainians to go to church. But we're going to actually serve God in Russia in our pre-modern Russian Orthodox Church. And Putin, who refused to cease fire, shows up in church, right? So that's the old church. That's the old church that got bound by state, right, which becomes just an instrument of power, right? We need, right, a, right, in this new world, we need a world religion. And the world religion has to be based on first principles and first values. It's the only possible way to go. And first principles and first values have to be shared by everyone across the globe. Right. That's a big deal. Right now, how do we do that? Let's bracket that for a second. Let's just first recognize the need for it. Can everyone see the need for it? Right. We need right, a new world religion that is rooted in first principles and first values that are recognized around the world. And here's the thing. We can't just declare them. Does everyone, we can't just declare them. OK, compassion, kindness. But that's not going to work. OK, we've got to actually show that there are first principles and first values rooted in. Right. Becky, you with me, sister, rooted in the very structures of cosmos itself. Uh, there's actually first principles and first values that are universally applicable, that are rooted in the very structure of cosmos itself from, from the beginning of time. Right? That apply all the way up and all the way down, not just declarations, not just claims. Right? What interfaith movement tried to do was say, interfaith movement tried to say, yeah, let's just, you know, we all believe in compassion and kindness. Let's all hold hands right, and sing together. Insufficient. Not going to get us home. We've got to actually say, what are the set of first principles and first values that actually bind human beings? And those first principles and first values need to articulate right, a universal grammar of value that becomes the ground of a world religion. And then that world religion needs to be a context for our diversity, meaning for a hundred different religions, right? And each religion can be unique and each religion has a unique expression. And each religion focuses on a different dimension and each religion becomes expert at, at something particular. And each religion is a unique self, right, of that body 
of human beings, right? Every religion itself has its unique self, has its unique voice, has its unique contribution, has its unique contribution to the grammar of value. But all of them, right? All of them, right? Everyone, everyone got this? All of them, right, actually share this, this universal grammar of value, these first principles and first values. Now, that world religion already lives in us, right? It's in us, right? And we have to, we have to articulate it. But we have to articulate in a way which is binding. We've got to articulate in a way that actually Putin reads it and he says, whoa, whoa, that never occurred to me. And we haven't done that. When I say Putin, I don't mean, you know, Tsar Vladimir. Tsar Vladimir is lost in pre-modernity. I'm talking about everyone around Putin. I'm talking about Alexander Dugan. I'm talking about, right, the, 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 the best of China, right? Right. The best of Turkey, right? The best of Hungary, the best of the Philippines, right? Right. The, the best of France where Macron, right? Right. Has been significantly threatened, right? In other words, we need, we need, right? Actually this articulation of first principles and first values that's so compelling that solves the challenges to first principles and first values. First principles and first values have gotten attacked very, very clearly and very powerfully and for very good reasons. And we're going to talk about that next week. So they've been dismissed. There's been this dismissal of our, of our capacity to articulate universal first principles and first values. They've been severely critiqued. That critique is ultimately true, but partial. We can answer that critique. We can transcend that critique. We've got to address it. We can't just new age bypass it. So what we're working on here together and David's about to resonate our code, right? What we're working on, working on here together is how do we actually articulate, right, a, a set of first principles and first values that are binding, that will be recognized by everybody in the world, right? That will be actually self-evidently true, but, but we can't just say they're self-evidently true. We got to say why they're self-evidently true. I'm not going to do all the work right now. I just want, I want to see what we need. And it's only a world religion that's going to actually stand against the world, the win-lose metrics. Does everyone get that? It's only a world religion that's going to say, no, 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 win-lose metrics, no, right? Pseudo-eros, story of value, rivalrous conflict based on win-lose metrics, no. There's a bigger story, right? There, there's a wider story, right? And, and it's only that wider story that's going to stand against a global technocracy, which upgrades algorithms and downgrades human beings, which is where we're going. Right. And I was talking to a young friend of mine who's, who's working in blockchain. Right. He's a beautiful, beautiful young man. And, and it's fantastic that we're talking. And all of his peers, same age, they get, let's say they're, they're getting absorbed into blockchain. And what is all their energy about? How to succeed in blockchain, to please mom and dad, to be successful, right? To make a salary, to get kudos for making a salary, to be rewarded, right? In the system of a success story. Right. And, and, if you're not actually talking to a wider frame of value, but and you're stuck in that success story, and all you want to do is succeed in that success story, and you spend virtually all of your time and energy succeeding, or let's say in perpetuating a blockchain, which the way it's going now is going to become another tool for rivals conflict, win-lose metrics, success story, disaster. And you get completely caught up in that system because that's your system, right? Because that's the story you're living in. So we got to create a better story of value. And that better story of value has to be rooted in first principles and first values. And we can't just declare them. We got to show how do you get there? Okay. How do you actually establish them? And what I want to talk with you about next week, if you're up for it, and I know, I know, and I want to, can I, can I, can I apologize to everybody? Right. Totally apologize. Everyone. I know what we just did today, right? It's now 145, right? How many people think this was hard to follow? It was hard, right? This was not, this was not easy. It takes thinking. It takes thinking. How many people are following? How many people are actually tracking with us and following? Okay. Who's give me a yes. Got one. Yes. Two. Yeses. Three, four, five, six. Anybody else? Anybody else? All in. Are we good? We good. Okay. Good. Okay. Fantastic. This is not easy to follow, right? If we were doing one mountain, let's say, let's talk about loneliness. Let's talk about sexuality, right? Let's talk about, these are really important things to talk about. Let's talk about gender. These are great topics. I've spent my life talking about them and trying to innovate in them. But now we're doing something harder. We're actually saying, can we actually go for the framework itself? Can we go to foundations, right? And so what we want to do the next few weeks is we want to actually do foundations together. 
And what I want to talk about with your permission next week, if, with your permission, everyone, I want to talk about how do we actually, what's the method, what's the method to where we can actually articulate a set of first principles and first values. So I'm, I want to begin with what's the problem? Why have first values and first principles been attacked? Right. And we can't be naive. We can't get lost in our bubble and be naive. Let's just declare first principles and first values. There's a reason why the notion of universal first principles and first values got decimated. I want to I want to kind of kind of get that, understand that with you together. Let's understand why they were rejected. Let's then answer, respond to the reasons they were rejected. Let's steel man those reasons. Let's show why there's powerful reasons to reject them and then show why in the end they're not the case. I think we can show that definitively powerfully in a way that hasn't happened yet in the universities. The universities are 25 years behind on this. I think we can show that actually it is completely possible to articulate universal sets of first principles and first values that are real. I want to actually together not talk about it. I want to actually, if you're up for this, we're going to actually do it next week. We're going to actually next week, we're making the revolution next week. We're going to actually do it here together. Okay. Like, wow. Whoa. Okay. So what we want to do for the rest of this week is we want to, we want to, so that that's our frame. We want to, we want to now complete our conversation of the last two weeks. Okay. And our conversation of the last two weeks was on prayer. Right. And, but we're going to use prayer as a model together. We're going to use prayer as a model of how can we talk about something that we can access in first person, right. In a new way. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to now in our last 15 minutes, we're going to talk about prayer. This is going to be our third week on prayer, but it's related to the world religion conversation because for example, a world religion requires prayer. Can't have a world religion without prayer. Why can't you have a world religion without prayer? We'll talk about that next week. Right. But prayer is not going to mean what it meant at level one. And I want to see if we can kind of get this in the chat box. Let's get this in the chat box. Okay. So let's say level one is religion. That's pre-modernity. Let's see if we can get it really clear. Can we, can we do this together? Level one's religion. Level, that's pre-modernity. Let's call that pre-modernity, the traditional period. Let's say till the Renaissance. Cool. Everyone got on that? Who's willing to write there? Someone willing to write traditional period till the Renaissance? So we can kind of see that, type that in. Fantastic. Right? No, no. But before we get to all three, go slow. Level one, religion, pre-modernity, traditional period till the Renaissance. Okay? Let's get that, right? I mean, let's see if we can just, we really get it together. So I don't want to talk at you. I want to talk with you. Let's talk together. Let's feel this together so you know this better than I do, okay? Before the Renaissance. Now, and then level two, now level two is no religion. That's modernity. No religion. Now, there's a lot of ways to say no religion. But for example, in the United States in the last 50 years, 30 years, excuse me, the most common self-identification for the younger generation is spiritual, but not religious. That's a version of no religion, spiritual, but not religious. And we're going to talk next week about why that's insufficient. Spiritual, but not religious, insufficient. It's too wishy-washy. It's non-binding. There's no sense of obligation. There's no sense of intrinsic value. It doesn't take you home, right? But that's level two, no religion, spiritual, but not religious. I do yoga, right? right I do therapy, right? And I live my life. And I keep doing yoga and therapy as the Ukraine's happening, right? I live my life. I'm, I'm in a very egocentric bubble. It's about me. It's about my transformation, right? I'm a spiritual materialist, right? I, I may pray, you know, for, for my own businesses to be successful, but basically I'm living in a global world where I'm affected by everything, but I'm actually parasiting off the world in my little spiritual, but not religious bubble. And I'm not actually a citizen of the world. I don't actually feel evolution moving through me. I don't feel like I'm participating in cosmos, but I'm not omni considerate for the whole, right? I'm not, I mean, I'm not actually taking the whole into account, but I'm in this very narrow bubble, living my own spiritual life, reading some sacred text if I'm really sophisticated, doing my yoga, going to retreats, right, right, et cetera, you know, healing my wounds, working on my trauma, right? Doing all that stuff. But actually, we live in a world in which the entire world's interconnected today. Right? I'm actually not part of that interconnection in any real way. Right? I'm not part of the unique self-symphony that's part of the healing of reality. I don't feel real, right? I'm in this very limited, separate self-spiritual identity. That's spiritual, but not religious. And there's lots of versions of that right, in modernity. So there's this no religion moment. Right? Now, level three, step three, step three, level three, now we got to claim religion again. That's always she comes in threes, trialectics. 
Everyone get that? She comes in through his trialectics. Okay, so we need to feel this, okay? We need to, so level three is, whoa, this is not working, right? When we removed the eros of a story of value, we removed the eros of a, of a world story of value, we were left with pseudo eros. And pseudo eros became rivalrous conflict, success story, right? Governed by win-lose metrics. And that leads us directly off the freaking cliff. Exponential growth curves driven by exponential technologies, right? Race to the bottom, tragedy of the commons, multipolar traps, right? We're literally, that's the meta crisis. The meta crisis is that we don't have interior technologies to govern our exterior technologies and our exterior technologies are going to destroy us imminently. Or said simply, we don't have a story equal to our power. When we don't have a story equal to our power, our power literally destroys us at this moment in history where our power is exponential. Does everyone get that? Does everyone get that? Everyone get that last two sentences was critical, right? We don't have a, a story of power equal to our, to our power. We don't have a story equal to our power. Our power is exponential. It drives us off the cliff of exponential growth curves, right? Which are driven by this win-lose metrics race to the bottom. Does everyone get that? Everyone, everyone's got that, okay? So the new, I want you to get this. The David, this is for you. Tom, this is for you from our, our, our conversation this week, right? In other words, there's new, and if we can get this sentence, anybody, there's new life conditions. Okay, can, I, I'm going to write that myself if someone else doesn't, right? There's new life conditions. New life conditions. Who's got that? New life conditions. New life conditions means 30 years ago, we could afford to go spiritual, but not religious. 30 years ago, Jerry, our friend, could create Shalom Mountain. Let's work with our trauma. That's fantastic. That was a great idea. And we could have you know, these principles of love that were basically about how we relate to each other as individuals working with our trauma. And, and we can do these circles of healing. And that's fantastic. And those should go on. And they're wonderful. And they're important. And they're critical. And they're gorgeous. But there's new life conditions. Right? 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 In other words, the new life conditions are we're part of a whole that's inescapable. We're living in the unbearable intimacy of that wholeness. We're collapsing and we're, we're collapsing value and colliding into each other. There's no place to hide. There's no place to go. Right? Right? Small groups of people can destroy the planet using exponential technologies. Right? There's, right, there's a list of crises, right, from climate to AI, right, to the gap between have and have nots, right, a long list that we've talked about, all of us, all of which place us in this very unbearably intimate small planet, which, which if we don't create a common language between us, we're destroyed. Wow, that's new life conditions. So new life, con new life conditions demand a new shared language of value. That's what we mean by a world religion. It's not just a world spirituality. When I started with my friend, Ken Wilbur, in 2010, we started the Center for World Spirituality to address largely this issue that we're talking about right now. But we called it world spirituality, not world religion. One is because religion was just so threatening. And by world spirituality, we meant, though, not spiritual, but not religious. We meant, we meant a trans-lineage vision in which we took the best elements of all the great lineages. We integrated them into a new whole. But, but we hadn't yet articulated this notion that we can't do that unless we have shared first principles and first values. So we need actually to find in all the lineages of reality, the lineages of pre-modernity, which are the lineages of the great traditions, the lineages of modernity, of science and psychology, right? The lineages of post-modernity, which are of, of history and how history develops and you know, how social constructions happen. We need to take from all the lineages of knowing we will actually find that if we actually link, if we link true gnosis, validated insight from all the lineages of knowing together into a larger whole, we will actually have a new story of value rooted in first principles and first values. That's actually, that will actually emerge. Now, we can't do that by making new age declarations. And we can't do it by now or academic papers. We need great academic writing. We need great larger writing, kind of larger kind of thinking, which is not in a kind of narrow academic form, but it's also not pop. We need actually to actually articulate, right, the core propositions, right, of value in a way that they become so self-evident, so true, that they actually become adopted, 
right? Right. In order to do that, we actually need institutional power, right? And it's institutional power, I mean, we need funding, we need resources, we need research, right? We need to be able to deliver these memes. We can't just stand a little corner and say, we're going to mystically do this. Now, there's great value to have a mystical society. We're a mystical society together, right? The, the, the Center for Integral Wisdom, One Mountain, we're a mystical society. We're, we're, a, we're, a, group, we're, a, we're a group of people in, in this new renaissance that we're trying to articulate that we're, we're connected to each other. We're a band of outrageous lovers and we're functioning as a mystical society. That's true. And that's beautiful. But then we have to also translate the mystical society. As Plato said, we have to become philosophers, but also philosopher kings. We have to actually generate the resources to deliver this into the source code of society. And then we have to commit suicide. By commit suicide, meaning, meaning we stop, I don't mean we commit suicide physically, meaning we actually give up power, right? And if we don't hold power, we give up power. Right? We actually create the codes. We create the documents. We create the structures that can actually hold and deliver this into society, right? And then we step back, right? And we step back. Right? And, and we do that because the principles and values that we're articulating require us to step back and, and, and leadership moves from generation to generation and we're held together by this evolving vision of value. And it can't be fixed, it can't be frozen. It's an evolving vision of value. So we've said a lot here, okay? We've said a lot, this is a lot, okay? This is a lot, okay? This is a lot, this is probably too much. So I apologize on the too much, right? So, so let's, we're gonna, we're gonna finish today Right, with the code. Okay, we're going to finish with the code. And the code is going to be about prayer. This is our last week of prayer. And I just want to do one practice of prayer. Okay, one practice of prayer. So we can kind of finish our last week on prayer. And then next week, we've got this, I mean, insanely huge week next week. Right? Right? Which is that next week, we're going to actually show how to do it. Right? How do we actually articulate the universal grammar of value? And I want to, I want to, with permission, I want to just, can I, Apologize to everyone. So I want to apologize. I actually I talked too long. We're going to do next week, you know, a Barbara memorial. And the topic of that memorial is going to be how do we actually do? It? We're going to actually do it together. We're going to talk about it. We're going to actually go through the steps of articulating, right? A, a universal grammar of value. Right. But before that, I just I just want to apologize. Right. I meant to just talk for a couple of minutes, right? And I got a little carried away. So I apologize. And, and I got carried away because this is this is so critical. Right? It burns in my heart. I know it burns in your heart. I want to just just me personally, Mark, right? just thank every single person who's here for for staying in, right, for for tracking, right, for for being with us, for for being able to to hold the space. OK, and what we'll do next week is we will have right, And this is this is a holy promise. What we'll do next week is we're going to actually, at the end, have a question and answer period. So we're going to have a little bit of an extended church. We're going to do a Barbara Memorial, right? Right. Which is, you know, it's three years and Barbara, we're with you. When I say a Barbara Memorial, it sounds way too dissociated. Like beloved, my beloved Barbara, we're going to be with you next week and, and you'll be with us and we'll be together in this three years since you've passed. And we're going to hold hands together and and take this the next step. So that's number one next week. Number two, we're going to actually do it. We're going to actually go into the laboratory together, not talk about it. We're literally going to together enact, right? The beginnings of a universal grammar of value. And we're going to show how we do it. What's the, what's the secret sauce, right? How is it done methodologically? We're going to raise the challenges. How do we, what's the, what are the challenges to value? And then we're actually going to, we're going to go do it together. So that's two. Okay. Wow. And then three, Right. We're going to actually we're going to actually have a question and answer period. So we can actually have a big question and answer period on this world religion topic because it's explosive. All right. It's a slippery slope. We got to get it right. But but why do we need to do it? Because there's new life conditions. All right. We can't afford not to do that. And in some sense today, I mean, I'm apologizing right? because in some sense today I was um, I was trying to work this out myself. I was working it out in in conversation right with you. And so I just, you know, so thank you. And next week we'll be in conversation in this, in this next album. So please accept my apology for, for talking kind of, you know, way over time. And, and thank you, thank you, thank you for your, your staying in, right? And we turn to David to resonate the code. And then we're going to do one fabulous exercise. And we're going to go to the holy and broken hallelujah. So here's this week's evolutionary love code. We need a world religion. And the code below is an example of 
a new world religion text. The God you don't believe in does not exist. God is not only, as she has been described by the great traditions, the infinity of power, but more profoundly, the infinity of intimacy. God is the infinity of intimacy, desiring finitude. God is the infinity of intimacy that does that, sorry, God is infinity of intimacy, desiring finitude. Prayer is intimate communion between the divine and the human. It is true that human beings participate in divinity. This is the first person of the divine that lives as us. It is no less true that we are held by divinity in every moment. Every time we fall, we fall into she, we fall into her arms. This is the second person of the divine. Prayer is intimate communion between the infinity of intimacy and the intimacy of finitude. And finally, divinity is the force of eros, always seeking deeper coherence and wider intimacies from quarks to culture and beyond. This is the third person of divinity. Wow. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn my word back to you, beloved Dr. Mark. David, David, beautiful, right? So, so let's, let's make a decision together, okay, sweethearts? Let's make a decision together right now. This, is, this code is so big and so important. It's such a big topic. So I'm actually not going to do a, a series of exercises on it now because it's, it's, it's actually 204. And that would take us, you know, another 40 minutes which, 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 you know, we, we, we at least meta theoretically do an hour, but we have, we have to, we have a big third week on prayer that we have to do. So here's my suggestion, right? One, let's next week dive into world religion. Okay. Like big time and let's make a revolution. Okay. And we're going to try and really break new ground. Now, of course, there's been people before who have said, yeah, let's, let's affirm universal value, right? You know, and I think somebody said, yeah, let's learn from the universalists that came before us. That's absolutely true. The weakness is, is that these universal claims were deeply criticized, right, by very rigorous philosophy. And 99%, they didn't respond to those criticisms. And so they were dismissed, right? They became kind of, you know, the, the province of kind of folk intuition or folk religion or new age or whatever it is, but weren't actually taken seriously, right? So they can't be the ground of a shared grammar of value. We have to actually take seriously the very rigorous critiques, right, of value and of the idea of creating a universal grammar of value. I think we can do that. We can do it very powerfully. But we have to do that. And from there, we articulate, right? Okay, what's the source of this, of this universal grammar of value? That's a big deal, right? And, and David's absolutely right. You know, 10 years ago, when we started the Center for World Spirituality, right, I, I coined this term dual citizen, right? And that's very, very important. David brings that, you know, on the table. And that's what I meant when I said that a world religion is a context for our diversity, right? In other words, we don't, we don't become part of this one, we become the one and the many. So that all the religions continue to exist. They continue to make their contribution, but there's a recognition that there's a shared grammar of value. And we actually articulate what it is and why it's binding. So for example, that means that the Russian Orthodox Church, right, in Russia and the Catholic Church in America, right, and the Sunni Muslim Church, right, in Syria, all have to relate to this world religion. Right? We can't use religion as a fig leaf for power, right? as a fig leaf for evil, right? which is what we're actually seeing tragically. It's, it's tragic beyond imagination right? to see how Islam and its beauty has been radicalized for power, right? to see how the Russian Orthodox Church has been radicalized for power, right? to see how right, through 400 years of European history, Christianity was radicalized right? for power, serving, serving motives that, that violate eros and violate love and, and violate goodness and violate truth and violate beauty, right? So we need to come to this new place, this level three, where we actually articulate, wow, something new is happening. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Is this possible or impossible to do, right? Anybody who's thinking, who thinks this is possible? Chat box. Let's find each other. Who thinks this is possible? Do you think this is possible? It's completely possible. 
It's totally possible, right? It's com- and, and it hasn't been done. So you would think, how could it be possible? We're going to do it here. So I know that there's this big party that says, I don't believe you. You're just, you're just, this is just some, you know, Mark or Barbara, they're just grandstanding. No, no, this is actually how it happens. It's not going to happen right, in the classical universities where everyone is. Universities are run by, I did my doctorate at Oxford. Universities are run by, what are they run by? Success stories, literally, driven by rivalrous conflict, governed by win lose metrics. Science today, right, is driven by success stories, right, governed by, right, rivalrous conflict, governed by win lose metrics, right? Science today, right, and, and the academies of learning today have been completely hijacked by the success stories, and on multiple levels. And we can't rely on the old church or in the new university to do this for us. So it's going to happen, right? It's going to happen on the fringes in which groups of people come together who are fiercely committed, who are holding a kind of purity in their hearts, a kind of second innocence, and who are going to take everything they have, their minds, their hearts, their bodies, and then take a stand for this possibility and articulate it in the deepest, most beautiful, and most deep, and most profound way can be articulated using all all the best methods. So that's us. And of course, we have partners around the world. It's gorgeous people. But but we've got, I mean, beware of knee-jerk humility, right? And it's very easy to look away. No, this, this couldn't be on us to do. Could this be on us to do? Could that be possible? We don't want it to be on us. Okay, we don't want it to be on us because too much responsibility, but actually joy and responsibility go together. This is on us to do. We're not going to do it ourselves. Once we articulate this, we we put it into the world. It's going to take us to our next five years or about. I think it's going to catch like wildfire. Right. But but this this next step, this next five, 10 years, this is on us now. Right. It's on us to get this right. Right. And, you know, I was just going to write an email to a, a young friend of mine in England right, about the necessity of having a beautiful paper comparing, you know, cosmorotic humanism, right, to to shelling, right, for example, right? And and I was just thinking in my mind how that paper is going to ricochet to that article, which is going to ricochet to that, which is going to ricochet to that, and then the whole system is going to come together and it's going to explode. But everyone's got their piece to do, right? So I just want to ask everyone, you know, if I can, permission, this is our practice, we're going to just do the practice and we're going to, we're going to just, just conclude with this. Here's our practice, right? Okay. Are we ready? Who's ready? Right. What, what's yours to do? Can I ask you that? Is that okay? Friends, beloveds, sweethearts, right? Can I ask you that? Like most personally, what's actually yours to do? Like what's yours? Right? What's yours? Not reading the news and what's yours specifically to do? that requires heart and resource, right? And time that's hard, that challenges your comfort zone, that doesn't fit into like, this is part of my personal therapy, you know, therapy, journey, trauma. No, no, no. What's yours to do? That's a gift. It's not self-help, which is what can I get out of it? It's transformation. What can I pour into it? What's yours to do as a unique self, as an evolutionary unique self, right? And that's the invitation. And, and I'm, I'm inviting just humbly, right? Just anyone join us, right? Find Krista, right? Krista, I'll get, put her, 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 her email in the chat box and Paul and Christina, right? And David, right? And, and Jacqueline and, right? And Jamie and, right? Shahad, right? And, and Claire, right? And, and Benjamin, right? And, right? Right? Tom, Terry, right? Peter, right? Zach, Mark, right? Let's, let's step up and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And it might be, I'm going to participate in the editing process. I'm going to help edit. It might be, I'm going to finance one book. I'm going to write one paper, right? I'm going to right, but, but step in and make this yours. This is not Zach's. This is not mine. This is not Taylor's. This is not Christina Kincaid's. It's not Christina Amelon's. This is, this is yours. This is ours, right? We can do this. So I just want to ask you that question. If I can, just, just so gently, what's yours to do? And what's the unique risk 
you need to take to do it, which gives up ego for a moment. One just says, okay, oh my God, I am, I am lived as, I am outrageous love. Right? And I'm going to blow this open outrageously. Right? Like, wow. What's mine to do? What's yours to do? So let's hold hands. Right? Let's crazy do it together. <laughs>